Bunt, the number one podcast in skateboarding. Brought to you by the number one shoe in skateboarding. Van. Off the wall since 1960, motherfucking six. I know I get called out a lot for throwing this term around, but we have an absolute legend, Anthony Van Anglin, in the building. Ave, what's cracking, man? What's happening, guys? Thanks for having me. Of course, yeah. man. As you know, we start every show off the same. You're a little prepped for this, but hit us with your favorite skate moment and your favorite sports moment. Okay. Favorite sports moment. Um, uh, Tyson Holyfield, the, the year bite. I was, you know, we were all skating out front waiting for the pay per view to kick in, and we went inside and watched the fight. Damn. That, was, that was pretty good, you know. Damn. Watch that live. That's an epic moment. Yeah. What was happening was like tyson losing the fight and that's why he did that i can't remember though i i mean holyfield was definitely you know giving it to him yeah for sure i think they called the fight yeah from what i remember mm -hmm. like it was kind of it was a bummer because well you knew what you were getting with tyson fights usually it's either it's gonna be you know two rounds yeah and it was gonna be over and uh but that one it was over pretty quick with the year bite. i can't i don't <laughs> remember that i don't remember the round but it was that's like, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. we were back out front skating and shit within like, I don't know, it felt like <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> you said you have two. What's the other one? Oh, the other one I was driving over here. So uh, game six, Jordan's last game uh, with the Bulls. Uh, I was out skating, me, Dill, Chris Ortiz, and I don't watch sports. I mean, of course, I watch a, like a game like that, you know, mm -hmm. if I was at home, but uh, we were out skating that day. And we were getting clips and the city was dead. <laughs> Ortiz, a big sports fan, he just kept, he was checking his pager. It was before the phones, <laughs> wow. right? And he was shooting a photo and we were right here in downtown LA and uh, it was a workshop ad came out. I was doing a switch front nose on a handrail in downtown at a shaved head. And uh, Ortiz was so stressed out because he wanted to be watching the fucking game. Dude. <laughs> yeah. We just had him running around the city all day. Um, and uh, we could see the security guards. They wouldn't even come out because they were watching the game and they were looking at us. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, the city was dead, man. Everybody was watching that game. That's sick. Yeah, no bust. That's a good sports moment right there. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, we got. How some... was he getting like updates on his pager? Like someone was texting him or something? I have no fucking clue. Like I just remember him all like kept checking his pager. And he kept <laughs> looking at the security guards because. He knew they were watching. Yeah, like if he could get some, like he was, yeah, he was stressing. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was down for the skate mission. So mm -hmm. I, I, he probably thought maybe he could be home by the time the game kicked on, but we kept going. Yeah. You know, we're not done yet. Yeah. yeah. So isn't it kind of crazy how like sports is so much more integrated into skating now than back then? Like even when we were at the warehouse yesterday, they had the Dodgers game on, which is like, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of guys you wouldn't expect, like Trujillo, mm -hmm. huge sports fan, you know, baseball yeah. fan and stuff. You know, you just wouldn't even expect it. But, yeah, I, I never got into kind of organized sports in a, like, religious way that people do in the, mm -hmm. here. But. And did you have a favorite skate moment? Favorite skate moment, favorite skate moment. I know I do. I'm going to drop the ball on this because I'm going to think about this later and be like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> um... You know, uh, there was a, a moment in time, it was a trip uh, during the DC video, uh, it, and Danny Way came on the trip in, to Barcelona, Spain, and uh, he hadn't been on the streets, but he had been stacking a gnarly vert part, mm -hmm. we knew that, and uh, he he had been saying, dude, I'm fucking, film, I'm going to film street tricks, dude, it's on, Sick. like, all this shit, and there was, like, <laughs> some funny back and forth between him and Deerdick, whatever, Danny, Deerdick was just like, Oh man, he's gonna be on the streets since Plan Plan B days, dude. It's changed, you know. Yeah. And like Danny's like, "Fuck that, I'm on this trip." Yeah. And um, you know, for me, growing up watching Plan B videos, and like Danny rode for the workshop, I knew Danny. But every time I was around, I was like, "Fucking Danny Way, dude!" Yeah. Like it was, it, you're starstruck, you know. And when he came on that trip for two fucking solid weeks, was out in the streets all day. That was gnarly and the 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 crazy thing was is too is i was like how's this gonna you know this is after he broke his neck after knee surgeries everything and even though he was like 
we knew he was just going crazy on the vert ramp. It's still like, yeah, if you ain't out in the streets a lot, like I was like, I don't know, what are we going to get? You know? Mm -hmm. And you know, he lay, dude, he back three Machba. Like, uh, oh, you were he, there for that one? Yeah. Like Sick. he, the first couple of days were kind of like, what if he was trying to get his legs, you know, like his street legs and he was just like filming whatever, you know, where you're like, <laughs> he's trying to figure it out and it was just crazy. And then, and then towards the end of like, I think the third day we ended up at that wavy spot and with the bar yeah. and he fucking blasted a huge, huge hip, heel flip out of it. And I was like, God damn, that was fucking sick. I couldn't even click my tail on that thing to <laughs> ollie it. I don't know how anybody's ever skated that. Uh, and then we literally went from there across the street, off the roof, into the over the gap, into the slant, concrete slant mm -hmm. um, from that era. And he switched front side flipped into it. That's what it minutes. was. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We and were then, trying to think of what that what trick he did into that. Yeah, and then then Makba, and then like a, a slew of other tricks like throughout the rest of the trip. And I felt like as a fan of skating and growing up watching Plan B videos, like I got to step back into that moment of greatness and be there live, you know, That's like sick. that was, that was probably one of the more epic experiences. Oh, Dan, yeah. Danny way in the streets. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So Abe, take us back to the beginning. Where'd you grow up and how'd you get into skating? Uh, originally I'm from San Diego. I was born in San Diego. Um, uh, most of my growing up was, uh, Orange County, uh, area all over. And then, uh, Lived up in L.A. and uh, then moved back to Orange County and um, always a skateboard around growing up in Southern California. Mm -hmm. um, my first first board, I, my, my grandmother lived in Mission Beach. Uh, there was some kid down the down the way who had this uh, a kamikaze, it was called. It was like a, one of those cheap toy store boards. Uh, like a bear flex or something like that mm -hmm. had like a rising sun on i think some, some sort of kamikaze graphic um <laughs> and uh i begged my grandmother can I, he's selling it can i buy it you know <laughs> it was already kind of beat up and it was, i think he sold it to me for like 10 bucks Hell yeah. so uh, deal. that and then it got ran over and then i um uh, once i got home it got ran over by the car and uh i just took a roll of duct tape and just fucking <laughs> wound that thing up I, it was a big thick roll of tape around the middle trying to like support it and it was just kind of the bowed now <laughs> and uh yeah and then it wasn't till a few years later that i just randomly i uh it was my birthday my stepdad uh was like hey what do you want for your birthday i was like i'm a skateboard like a pro pro board you know mm -hmm. so um uh he gave me a hundred bucks. He said, bring 50 back. <laughs> and I went to the skate shop and oddly enough, we had, he had friends over the night before and they were playing poker and someone was walking through me through some hands and I won some. So I had 80 bucks from oh, that shit. night before. Right. So when I got to the store, you know, even back then, this was probably like 87 or 88. Um, boards were still over a hundred bucks for yeah. a full setup, you know? Um, so I had, I had it and I was able to bring the 50 back. Um, and, uh, yeah, I bought a visionally Ralph and that's kind of where it started, you know? Um, yeah. So what would you consider your first big break in the skate industry? What really like started off your career? I think I, I was getting, started getting boards and stuff from channel one when I was like 16 and, uh, skating for companies like TSA and Volcom and stuff. But I, uh, you know, those were all things in my area and, um, uh, I don't know if I ever really had aspirations to like, because the people I looked up to, like we we're talking about like Danny ways and stuff like that was a whole nother, like, mm -hmm. like, like playing field, you know, or I, so I think, you know, fast forwarding to like kind of what happened a little down the road from that time period, um, was kind of around like 18 or 19 that I I had a bit more of a drive to see how far maybe I could take things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Or drive to, you know, do better than I was before. Cause I, you know, I'd skate, I was good enough, I got stuff, but then like, a, you know, like most kids fall into girls party and all these things. And then, you know, six months didn't go by, I didn't really skate. I'm hanging out doing other things, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? But it, 
kind of the turning point was about 18 years old, like where I really picked it up again and, and, uh, stuck with it and started, things started happening from there pretty quickly, 23. And then quickly after that was workshop and DC and, you know, all that stuff. Sick. Sick. Yeah. So you and Dill, epic one-two punch over the years. Uh, what's yeah. the story of you guys first meeting? <sighs> That's hard because we grew up in the same area kind of and you know Dill, Dill's two years older than me um and he was already like he was already doing it when I was young like he wrote for Black Label and uh in Vans and I knew of him and occasionally like occasionally we'd run into each other but we kind of didn't really know each other you know kids are weird when they're that mm -hmm. age and you're like both kind of good at skating you're like <laughs> Who is this guy? Well, right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, um, but I don't even, I wouldn't even say it was that. It just, it's just skating. It's vibey when you're young, you know, like you're just like, and especially he's from Huntington. I think one of the first times we were around each other was Huntington High. And so on the weekends at Huntington High, dude, I mean, there would be a hundred skaters there and there was multiple things to be skating. And there was this handrail, uh, in this kind of covered area that was like, I think it was like a six or a seven stair and a big ass kink on it. And uh, Dill, he told me this later, he had no slid it like the week before. And I no slid it the day that I uh -oh. was there. And oh, he was shit. there. Yeah. But I remember going, so that was one of our first times. And then I remember going back like not too long later and someone's like, bullshit, you didn't know slide it. Cause it's back <laughs> when we didn't film it, right? Or whatever. So I was like, I'll do it again. And I sacked the, oh. the kink and then fell straight onto my forehead and split my head open. Like it was gnarly. <laughs> yeah, I just did like a one footed Ollie and like just totally clipped the kink. But um, so the homie still doesn't believe you to this day. <laughs> That you did it. <laughs> He's got to take his word for yeah, it. Yeah, there was some people there the day that it happened, like, but uh, that was one of the first times. And then, like, I, re I remember running him like a like skate cruise, like we were at like, some Taco Bell somewhere, and like, oh, because I wasn't even sponsored then, and like he obviously was, and the people he was. So you're super like weird because <laughs> they're the you know sponsored professional or whatever you know. Um, so it's like a lot of meetings like that throughout the years, and then. Uh, on into like when he was on 101 and stuff and uh and you know occasionally like being on sessions uh we had some mutual friends and stuff and then it was kind of like 97 after 101 right when he was doing 23 uh we ran into each other at the Huntington skate park and uh we just started talking and stuff and He's like, oh, man, because that was right around the time where I really started had been skating a lot again and really like kind of focused. And uh, he was just like, man, he's like, you look like you've been skating a lot, man. And he's like, you got footage like, you know, I was like, yeah, yeah. So we like we started hooking up and skating and like, you know, I showed him my footage and he started helping me help me out. Sick. Basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you and Dill had an apartment nicknamed Fight Club. What was that era like, and how does an apartment get that name? Yeah, um, well, that was my apartment, actually. Dill <laughs> at, with Deerdick, uh, oddly enough. Um, no. So Deerdick was living in San Diego, and I had moved. Me and Dill had an apartment in West Hollywood in, like, 97. And uh, I, I think I was making a total of $500 a month as an amateur then. Um, and you know what, I don't know what rent was 250. <laughs> it's just like, and, but there was a workshop house down in San Diego. It was right when we got a workshop and I was like, fuck this. I'm moving down there for free. <laughs> and you know, uh, so I did that. And once I got down there for maybe six months, I was like, I can't do this place. Like, <laughs> I gotta go back to LA. So, uh, Deerdick wanted to have a spot in LA, even though he was living in San Diego. So he and I rented an apartment together and he had a deadbolt on his door because he wasn't there all the time, but he didn't want us in his little room. Yeah. It was, I remember it was like 800 bucks a month. It was a two bedroom kitchen, like upstairs apartment. It was kind of a, just bare bones. Like, um, and 
sure it could have been fine but we definitely made it shitty you know <laughs> like so it was shitty um and dill would come stay a lot at that point i think dill was already like uh in new york a lot at that point um so and like fred gall and stuff so just you know drinking coming back bloodied from whatever <laughs> fight club like just yeah, every night was a uh an adventure man yeah <laughs> So. When Freddie's in the mix, for yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like, we, you know, it's just w fucking wild, man. Yeah. Good That's times. Epic. Uh, can you tell us about the time you and Dill got arrested in Phoenix? What's the story there? Yeah, we uh, were on a trans world trip. Um, what was the name of that video? Feedback? No. Feedback? It was before that. It was like... I think the cover was like Dill Alling some train tracks on with like satellites behind him or something. And um, our first stop was in Arizona, uh, Youngstown, Arizona. I don't know if I've ever even returned there or driven through there again. <laughs> um, but uh, we pull up and that's like one of those places where it's like you get to the town and there's a sign entering Youngstown, Arizona. And there was a sheriff parked right at the sign. And we drove by, we were in a van and uh, went to a motel. I don't know if we had, had already gotten reservations there or if we were just winging it. Um, but we were parked in the motel and somebody had gone to go do the uh, check-in deal. And uh, the sheriff comes into the lot and kind of drives by the van slowly and then takes off. Um, like, okay, weird. Of course, we've been like smoking weed the whole way and all that shit and had weed on us. And this was before everything was legal. Uh, <laughs> but um, check in, all this and this and that. Jonas Ray was on a trip. Me, Jonas, Dill walk from the hotel to a Circle K, like a block away. And uh, it was really weird. We go in there. The guy has like a police radio going in the Circle K behind the counter like a CB or some sort of mm -hmm. thing. Um, and he's asking us weird questions and we go in and Jonas tries to buy a 12 pack and the guy's like, Oh, it's past alcohol, like curfew. Like his first question was like, how much money you guys got? And like <laughs> all this shit. Like, and Dill was like, man, shut the fuck up. Like what, why are you asking me how much money I have? Like this is circle K like I'm buying, like what, you know, it was weird. And, yeah. and, and then he snapped on Jonas for trying to buy this beer and, Basically saying like, and then he was, and then it went escalated really quick to like, I'm calling the police. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was really weird from what I can remember, man. Like I was also baked too. So I was just <laughs> like, but I'd had milk and cereal in my hands. I was stoned. Like I had fucking like Lucky you Charms and some milk, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I wasn't even trying to buy alcohol. Um, and I mean, that sheriff was out front in like a minute you know and we walk out and he sits us all down on the curb and um then uh somehow jonas the only one who may have broken some sort of law got cut loose right out the gate um, <laughs> and uh and he kept me and dill there and this is long haired dill days and i'm sure my eyes were bloodshot and just <laughs> like you know we were probably like you know, crazy. And, uh, he kind of separated us and the guy got out and he was, I mean, this is some country ass shit, like cigarette between the front of his teeth, talking oh, yeah. to us, like smoking, inhaling, like doing it all, <laughs> like not even touching the cigarette, you know, cowboy yeah. hat, cop, sheriff, fucking, oh, yeah. then his partner pulls up and he's like, okay, let me see your IDs. And I'm like, Oh, I, I don't even know if I had mine on me or what. And uh, probably not. Um, that's why he probably detained me and uh, <laughs> or it kept me there because he's like, well, I'm going to need to see your ID at some point. Um, and Dill had bought an ID, a fake ID before we left. He didn't have any ID. So he was like, I need an ID because we go somewhere where I need a fucking drink or whatever. So he bought that in downtown L.A. before we left and with some funny name on it. And <laughs> you know registered to like georgia or something and uh so he hands that thing over to the cop and they're literally like trying to like they're 
you know, searching the name, the address, they, they're trying to call, I don't even know what, but they're really working on this. And then the other cop pulls me to the side and starts asking me questions and, uh, about, you know, what kind of drugs you guys on and like all this stuff. I'm like, dude, nothing, man. Like, what are you talking about? You know? And, uh, long story short, puts me in the back of the car and he's like, can I search your room? And I was just like, under what, why, mm -hmm, you know? Yeah. And he's like, I'm going to search that room, you know? And I was just like, so whatever, he fuck drives me over there, opens the door, starts going through my stuff. And I'm like standing there and I, I don't even know if I was handcuffed or what, but I'm standing out like looking into the room. And then he gets over to Dill's bed <laughs> and he looks at me like as he's about to go into his bag. It was really weird. It was creepy. I was like, <laughs> I was like, hey, man, he ain't even here. Like you can't. I, I, I'm not consenting to you searching his stuff. And I knew what was in the bag, you know, <laughs> like so I was trying my last ditch effort to like <laughs> hold there, this please. guy off, you know what I mean? And he's like, this room's registered to you, right? I can, you could go like, this is your room. And I was like, yeah, but if I needed some fucking toothpaste from this guy, I ain't going to go in his bag. I'm going to ask him, you know, yeah. like, he's like, you turn around, don't look in here. <laughs> like, he comes out. I, then I think he might've handcuffed me, turned me around and he went through everything. And he's like, yep, you guys are busted. I was just like, I didn't say shit. Put me back in the car and, uh, got out, left me in the car, went up to Dill. And I, Dill told me this later. He came, went up to Dill. He's like, yeah, I found it. I <laughs> I found his stuff and Dill's like, bullshit. You didn't find anything. Cause he wasn't naming it. You know, he wasn't yeah. like, I found the weed, you know, he yeah. was like, I found your shit. You guys are busted. And Dill called his bluff and was like, you didn't find shit. He found my fake ID. So that's why he kept me. Cause oh. I had an ID that was a real ID from someone I knew, uh, who got a new one. So, uh, but it obviously was not me. So now, <laughs> Dill finally fessed up to his fake ID. They got us on fake these fake IDs, right? Okay. Took us to some little substation, and uh, that was funny too. That was crazy. They were really trying to scare us, you know. They were onto you from the second you drove into that town, eh? Yeah, yeah they were like, yeah. And somehow you didn't find fucking weed. It's just just a trip. Like <laughs> it wasn't like, yeah, dude. They didn't. He didn't find the weed. It's crazy. Why would Dill make the choice to go get a fake ID instead of a real one if he needed one for the trip? What's the I mean, thought process that, behind back that? Back then, things like that were perfectly logical. <laughs> like, it's just back then, that was sense. a logical, you know, deal. I mean, who knows the way things work now? You can really like expedite things pretty quickly, but I might have taken, you know, by mail, by by horse and carriage back in 98. <laughs> you uh, take it 90 yeah. days or something. Yeah. <laughs> Six weeks to get your California ID, yeah. you know. Um, but it was something like that. And we were, it was like, I need an ID tomorrow. Yeah. Like, you know, we didn't do things like, well, it's going to take three weeks to get it in the mail. Like, let me go out and be responsible and do this. It's like, no, let's go down to MacArthur Park and <laughs> fucking go into some back alley, have some guys shoot a photo of it. And okay, done deal. We're ready to go. Yeah. Plus, they weren't very technical back then. They were, all, like, it was they were fake, cheap yeah. looking, even real ones, you know? Mm -hmm. They didn't have barcodes or any of that stuff they got now, so, yeah. Sounds like a good time, man. Yeah, it was, the, it was, it was a good time, man. <laughs> I wish we could go back to those times. Yeah. So, the DC video, generational classic. Tell us about filming for that video and then maybe share a Deer Dick story from that time, if you have one. Um... Filming for that video was it was a good time. Um, it was those it was the era, and I was at the age where it's just like, you know, you party all night and get up and and you're not phased, and mm -hmm. you know, so it was just a lot of craziness and a lot of traveling, traveling the world and skating, and it was just a, it was just a pretty good time. And like I said, you know, I'd already shared the Danny story. So there was just a lot of like epic moments mixed in there too, you know, um, deer dick stories. I don't know. It's so hard to say. I mean, I had so many good times with deer dick, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, over the years, like I can't really pinpoint a particular story that jumps out to me with him, but like, you know, 
Deirdick, uh, yeah, he was on all those trips along for a lot of the partying too. So what was it like when he introduced big black to the crew? Um, you had that like epic cameo in the DC right. video too, where you share your, that was kind of late <laughs> in the, that was towards the end. Um, and, uh, I think Deirdick was trying to, um, kind of, f- that people had started amassing pretty big parts and Deirdick had, you know, a good part in there, but I don't think he had the part that he wanted or that he thought was standing up to others and stuff. And I don't know if it was a conscious decision, like, Ooh, I need to have something extra to kind of fill up my thing. Um, but it, I think it was sort of some of that was in there, but, um, uh, so the idea for this kind of like personal security guard skit came, came to life. And Greg Hunt is actually who found big black and, um, was really started kind of building that, that script out, you know, obviously a lot along with Deirdick, you know? So, and then once he kind of came aboard, he was just like, I mean, shit, like he might as well just had a skateboard. Yeah. You know, he became part of the, the crew, you know? That's sick. So sick. Yeah. Um, in that era, you got to skate love a lot in the run skate chill days, iconic era. Yeah. Uh, can you take us behind the scenes on that epic switch Manny switch tray? Yeah, that was a like, that was a like kind of a magic day for me because I had never tried that trick and I never, I wasn't contemplating doing that trick there that day. I just showed up and started kind of just warming up switch manually in that ledge and I just had this real like relaxed kind of control that day. And I was like, started, I could throw that and then I did it. That was it. Oh yeah. Switch yeah. tray, my favorite trick by far. So hats off. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. One. No, I mean, I was, that was one of those tricks when I did it, I was like, it was like one of the, one of the more satisfying tricks of my life. Hell yeah. 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 When that was landed. So that was sure. flawless. Um, yeah. Maybe not one of the more satisfying tricks in your life came from that video as well. What were you thinking when you tried to board slide that like bendable up <laughs> rail? Oh, in Japan? I don't know where it was, but it's I in the I was trying DC. to fee, uh, feeble. Feeble? Did it bend? I don't know. That thing was crazy. That was, um, or was I trying to, I might've been just trying to 50 it. We were, it was a demo in Japan, uh, outside of Tokyo. It was actually a really sick setup. It was a huge area on the water. It was like, um, and they had this, like, it was just wide open with ledges sprinkled everywhere and like weird things like that. Um, and, uh, I think I tried, it was trying to just 50 up it and, uh, yeah, I just got caught up and just grabbed my nuts and actually Nothing really, it wasn't that bad, but I broke fingers Oh, because shit. The way you the, my fingers took all the, Impact. my hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I remember we had to go to the hospital and they put like some sort of finger splints on me or whatever. But, uh, I got, I got all that lucky. Cause if I wouldn't have, I probably would have got pretty fucked up. Yeah. Um, you made a pretty big fashion statement at the DC video premiere. I think you rocked cornrows. No, so- I had, uh, uh, boots on. Uh, oh, cowboy boots? Yeah, cowboy boots, <laughs> yeah. So you didn't shy away from the fashion statements, man. What do you think about that era looking back? Um, fuck. <laughs> just whatever. Like I said, <laughs> just so much partying and, like, especially being young, like, I think, you know, I think for me personally, like, it was just, like, this whirlwind of everything and you start, you start to kind of, like, just be kind of wild, man, you know, like <laughs> really goes. Yeah. You know? And then like, and that's just kind of where I was at at that time. You know, I probably thought I was some sort of fucking rock star or something, you know, <laughs> I think you but, were, to be <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but yeah. So yeah, I showed up in fucking zebra skin cowboy boots. Was that there. the like same time you popped up on the Ozzy Osbourne reality show? Like, that was that a era? little later. I think. How did that happen? Uh, Jason's good friends with, uh, Jack, was it? Uh, Jack, son? yeah. And then also my other, uh, our good friend and partner in FA, Mikey, uh, uh, they were both uh, friends with Jack and Kelly. And um, so it was just kind of like those worlds just kind of collided. And uh, Dill was staying over there at that time. And I was a huge 
Ozzy fan, always have been, and um, I was just like, dude, you gotta get me over there. <laughs> like, I gotta come over. And uh, he uh, he called me one day. He's like, the family's gone. Crew's over. <laughs> dude, we were in the house, like just mm-hmm. me and him. It was fucking crazy. He took me into Ozzy's art room. Shit, we're looking at all the like demons and shitty paints, and uh, just it was fucking crazy. Like cruising through that house and uh, seeing just whatever, stepping into that dude's world. And I I never even met him. I, I was there a couple times and Ozzy was there and I, I was just too like freaked out to even try to like attempt to meet him or anything like that. But he's just cruising, hobbling around. <laughs> fucking <laughs> so, like, so gnarly. That's but um, yeah, it was pretty, that was pretty rad. So he, that's how I ended up getting over there a little bit nice brian wenning one of our all-time favorites yeah you two some uh switch ledge gods i'd say did you guys skate much together back in the day kind of working on that switch innovation together um obviously we did skate together uh but you know he was mostly i mean i was on the east coast a lot too but um i did pick wedding up from the airport um uh, and um right when he got on the workshop and he came to California and I picked him up and I don't even think I had seen his footage really yet. Maybe I had, I don't know, but I remember being like, cause he's very, when you see him, especially back then when he was young, he just didn't seem like, he didn't seem like he was a good skater. (laughs) Like he was just kind of (laughs) like, like, you know, kind of just, I don't want to say Ophi, but like, and they had like a broken arm and just kind of weird fitting clothes. And his board was fucking thrashed. And he was getting boards at this time. Yeah. And I just remember being like, what the fuck? <laughs> and uh, we took him over to Deerdick's training facility, TF or whatever he called it, uh, in uh, San Diego. And we skated and he'd start switch back tail in the tall box. And I was like, oh shit. Like, you know, so uh, yeah. He was gnarly. He was good. So sick. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, this wasn't planned, but it seems like I got all the Rob Deerdick questions, but just one more. What's the story behind Deerdick's Rolex? Deerdick's Rolex. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which Rolex <laughs> <laughs> at this point? Um, well, there was a ro- Okay. There's a, uh, I bought after the DC video, um, I bought a used Rolex, uh, I think I might have spent. It was a gold presidential Sick. black face, no nothing on it, but uh, gold arms, just pure black face presidential. And I was always like, "Oh, this is like, this is this is a watch like Emmett Smith wears." You know <laughs> what I mean? Like, this is a fucking NFL watch. Like, mm-hmm. and I was like, "This is so fucking ridiculous." I'm buying this thing. It was used. <laughs> I bought it at a pawn shop in Orange County, and uh, I. Shortly thereafter, had it back in Hawk because I needed money. And uh, <laughs> then I got it out of Hawk. I, was like, I don't know what it f- was for. Um, then I probably had it for some time. And Deerdick was always like, dude, that thing's fucking sick. You know, we call it the NFL watch. And uh, and he already was had all, all kinds of stuff like that with diamonds and stuff on it. I didn't have any of that on it. I was like, I just want classy, like, you know, just gold. And... Uh, I don't even know if I wore it a ton. It was just more of like a, I had money to burn, bought it. And uh, then came another time I needed money again. And it was actually around the time I, I, I had left DC. So I think it was like 2005 and I was in between paychecks and getting my Vans thing going and I needed to get an apartment and like all these things were happening and I had like no money and I had an insane IRS bill. Um, and, um, uh, I sold it to him for five grand, um, which was steel. And uh, that was that was it. And so I guess this is my Deerdick story of uh, which to the earlier question about a Deerdick story, but it's come full circle in the last uh, few months is he, 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 I will stay in touch periodically through Instagram or whatever. And he has a, 
slipper company and he had sent me some slippers like, you know, last year or something. And he hit me out of the blue and was like, Hey, he's got the same address. I was like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, I figured he'd send me some more slippers. I come home one day and there's a box on my front porch and this is only a few months ago. And, uh, I just, I was, I was the Deerdick box and I put it down and went in, like did a bunch of shit and, uh, finally got around to opening it and pull it out. Rolex box. No and I'm way. like, God damn, what, what the fuck is this? And then I I open it up. There it is. There's the NFL wow. watch. Sick. And um and uh I was like, holy I was tripping. Uh this watch is worth way more than uh five or ten grand now. Um and on the back it said uh Sodi 2015 in, engraved. Damn. Wow. And he wrote a card and stuff, and he had been wanting to get it back to me since 2015. He's, but he had he hadn't gotten around to get engraving it. Mm -hmm. So he finally uh, engraved it and uh, and just shot it into the mail to me. That's, that's so sick. Yeah. Epic. Hell yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, that's one of the nicest things anybody's ever given me. And uh, yeah. And it's just that even though we don't. Uh, you know, his, his life has taken on a whole different trajectory and, and all that stuff. And when we, on the rare occasions that we do communicate, it's fucking like, we're still living at fight club. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? And you know, he's just like such a, uh, it's a testament to the kind of person Rob is, you know, um, to, to do something like that. So that's that awesome. pretty cool. Yeah. That's a great yeah. moment. Um, so your boy, John Fitz told us, uh, one of the funniest things he's ever witnessed was a surfing collision in San Clemente. Not sure when that was. Oh, uh, yeah. What's the story there? Oh, fuck. It was, um, we were, yeah, surfing down at uh, Lowers area down there and uh, super crowded morning. Like, where it's just, fuck, there's more people in water out there. It was just, <laughs> like, insane. And every wave you drop in on, someone's, you know, two, three people are dropping in. So you're pulling out, like, to, you know, be respectful and all that stuff. And and I drop into a wave, but somebody else had the right away. So I just bottom turn and, like, shot out the back, right? And when you shot shoot out the back, sometimes you get, you get some good air, right? Mm -hmm. And I shot out probably, like, I was probably six feet up, you know, like going to dive back into the water. And, um, fuck, there was a dude right there. I just landed <laughs> right on his back, dude. Oh, no. <laughs> like le I body slammed this dude and he was so bummed. I mean, naturally, like he's like, God damn, man, you don't got to body slam me. And I was just like, fuck bro. Sorry. Like you were there. Like, I don't know, oh. man. It was, yeah, so that it was fucking hilarious. But John was in like, a front row seat to that one. <laughs> he loved that one, yeah. eh? Hell yeah. <laughs> I mean, good thing I didn't land on some, like, you know, there's some locals down in those zones, man. You've been on the fucking beach fist fighting for sure. But <laughs> he was, it was pretty mellow. Yeah. Your van propeller part, another instant classic. The song, the skating, everything works so well together. Some might even say it's your best part of all time. How good were you feeling on the board working on that video? Uh, super good. I, that was like, I think that was, well, it was, that was the hardest and most focused I'd ever worked in my career. Like, uh, a hundred percent sober and just like, I'm going to do the absolute best thing that I physically can. And I'm going to skate every single day that I can until this thing's done. And, uh, that was, that was the mindset and the mission on that one. So, um, I was lucky to, you know, get through that relatively injury free too. And, uh, just to kind of stay on that, that, you know, that vision that I had of skating a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Throughout filming for that, did Sodi ever cross your mind? Did you think it was a realistic thing? Like how did that, how surprised were you when that happened? I definitely was surprised and we, it was kind of right before people really started lining things up for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It was like, I think the year before was like the first of like all the contenders and like really the big push to, uh, cause I feel like before that it was just announced, Yeah, you know, um, sometimes even you'd pick up the mag, like, right. You know, um, it wasn't, 
because it was right around that time of social media really exploding and stuff and people starting to market things differently and stuff like that. So um, I think Propeller came out a year before that announcement. So it wasn't lined up for that uh, mm -hmm. totally. So um, I think towards the end, like there was, you know, you start to hear people's, you know, kind of say like, yeah, maybe, maybe this is your, you know what I mean? And so it was kind of like that. And um, like I said, it, Propeller came out and there still was a long way to that point. And um, I definitely, once Propeller came out, like knew I was in that conversation and um, continued skating and and um, trying to film and stuff just to be in the conversation towards the end and stuff like that. So uh, it's definitely on my mind, but I, it also, uh, things like that always seemed like, yeah, I don't know. They just seem for other people. Like not like you know, it's like the same. Like you know, like Danny Way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like shit. I was like, you know. So uh, whatever. But uh, yeah, it ended up being me, and uh, it was cool. I was, oh, yeah, yeah. so was sick. Very stoked, and mm -hmm. you know, and I was proud. Like I, I'd given everything I had. Like I could say that without a doubt on Propeller. Like where it was like. That's one thing, like, no, no matter what, for the rest of my life, like, you know, I can go to sleep knowing, like, there was a time period you gave everything that you had, mm -hmm. and that's a good feeling. And uh, so when I did get it, I was, you know, I was, I was proud of myself to, you know, be in that conversation and be awarded that, so. Hell yeah, man. What did you think about getting surprised by the guy covered in bronze paint? <laughs> that was incredible. I can't believe it. I know who would have thought that Cody who Green that is the who who is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh Cody, oh, filmer. Okay. Oh god. Yeah, he's he's the band's filmer and now he's been filming working for the workshop or uh <laughs> not the workshop, FA for years now. He's like he's our guy. So you know? But yeah, I showed up, I was like, holy shit, Cody is <laughs> <laughs> fucking the statue. Yeah, like, the Sody statue. Like, whoa, that was incredible. Yeah, I think in the clip you're rolling up and you're like, that's creepy, dude. <laughs> yeah, that was that, that was incredible. I, I, if that was a Burnett, like if Burnett saw that and knew that that was going to be that great, I mean, that this is genius. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you guys were starting to think about quitting Alien and you kind of knew the writing was on the wall for that coming to an end, at what point did creating F.A. come into play? Um, that was all Dill. Um, so we quit in the middle of Propeller. Actually, it was kind of like, I feel like I, I feel like we still had like two, like almost two more years of filming when we left, uh, the workshop. But, um, the right, the Dill had ended up staying with me kind of at the start of Propeller. He was kind of getting his shit together. Um, and had to get out of New York just to like get a new, just just get out of New York, come to LA, figure out if he's still skating, whatever he was going to do. And uh, he showed up and he had some fucked up like banana board with like <laughs> roller skate wheels on it or something. And uh, he was staying down the street at a friend of ours house and um, I'd pick him up, we'd go eat, whatever, hang out and stuff. And then finally I was like, hey man, like, let's go to the skate park. Because we had that park in North Hollywood. And uh, I mean, he was like, oh, okay, yeah, all right. And uh, so he fucking showed up with this board. <laughs> I was like, dude, we gotta get you a real board, dude. <laughs> I think he skated that that night, you know, just kind of yeah. cruising around and stuff, because he hadn't been skating. And uh, then we took him, he's like, what are you riding? He's he always like, what are you riding now? Like, just give me what you're get riding. And so I set him a board up and what I was riding and then, and then, uh, do we start skating every night, just full skate rat, watching skate videos and, um, fucking, and he started getting healthy again and fucking ripping. And, um, and then I owned a house over in Hancock park area. And he, I was like, just come stay over here, man. I had an extra room and shit. And so fucking, we just started going on tours and like, just whatever. Then he got on vans and, um, I, 
I, I really uh, pushed for him to get on this trip to New Zealand. He wasn't on the team yet. Um, but Justin Regan was uh, working for Vans at the time who grew up with Dill and Huntington, Jamie Hart, obviously. So these people know Dill li like from when he was little and I was, and they just know Dill, you know? And uh, I was just like, dude, let's just get him on the fucking trip. And I, those guys were fucking, they made it happen. They were like, all right, we'll get Dill on the trip, you know? <laughs> and, um, which I don't know if that's ever happened for someone to get on an international trip, not being on the team <laughs> officially and get like, you know, everything paid for, but we did it. And then he got on the team, you know, right after that. So, uh, it was that era, just a lot of skating and a lot of reconnecting for me and Jason, um, and our paths kind of realigning, you know, in like sobriety and skating. And, um, we did the, uh, trans world section with Benny, um, uh, for the workshop, what was that? Uh, cinema cinematographer project. Yeah, we did that in that time. So sick. And um, and then there was weird things going on with the workshop, like just you know, like I don't even know if it, if I want to say it was weird. Like it just they were going through whatever companies go through at different periods, you know. Like uh, uh, they had been sold to Burton during the minefield era. Then it, around this era, they were um, pulling out of Burton and there was a lot of products getting made that we didn't like. And uh, this was the kind of the era of like Deirdrick still having pro model boards, but they were like geared towards his TV stuff. And mm. I know those things were paying the bills, you know, like, and especially being a company owner now, I, I have a, you know, a deeper insight to what that experience is like. And, um, and, uh, you know, back then when we're just out in the street going on tours and shit, we're like, fuck this shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> this ain't, you know what I mean? This ain't what we're about. And, uh, shit like that was starting to happen. And, uh, so it was just kind of started becoming a question of like trying to the back and forth between the headquarters of workshop and what we wanted and what we were doing. And, uh, then dear to kind of getting into the role of starting to buy it. And, but there was a lot of transactions behind the scenes that you just hear about that. You just didn't know what was going on. And I don't know if it really fucking mattered like to us, like where, what warehouse the stuff was in. But at the time, I guess it did for us or something. We're just like, what's going on over there, you know? And, uh, uh, I think Dill was, before he had brought up the idea of turning FA into a board company, I'm sure he had been chewing on it for a while, you know, before mm -hmm. he even said a word to anybody about it. Mm -hmm. And one day he just called me and, uh, was like, Hey, I need to talk to you. You know, let's meet up. So, and he had, he got his own place at this point and, uh, uh, was fully living back in LA and got an apartment and stuff. And, uh, I went and met him and he's like, I want to take FA and turn it into a board company. And I was just like, dude, that's fucking sick. Yes. Let's go. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like, let's go, let's go yesterday, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, and I hadn't even been thinking on this terms like either, but when he said it, it was almost like a subconscious thing where I was just like, it's time, it's time for that. You know, like, yes, something new. You know, um, and, uh, yeah. So that first time we kind of, and we discussed a lot of the early team writers on that day too, you know, cause they were already in our mix, you know, like Sage, mm -hmm. Aiden, um, Terp, like, uh, Sean, um, not Kel was already on real, uh, but he was in our mix. We knew that was going to happen and we knew it wasn't even going to be a problem because it would be so obvious that he would come over and, uh, KB, like it was just such an organic time period. Dill lived behind Supreme. All those kids were in the back of Supreme. We were all skating together. Some of them were on flow for workshop and <clears throat> it was happening mm -hmm. already. It wasn't something like we got to, we're going to start a company and we're going to, you know, go out and get a bunch of guys, you know, yeah. it was just what was happening and uh, the natural next step. So that was the start. 
Yeah, Hell yeah. You mentioned him briefly, but um, you and Dill, obviously a huge part of that. But uh, can you tell us about Benny Maglineo and kind of his impact on FA and hockey behind the scenes? Huge. Like, um, I filmed with, I met Benny in Minefield era. He was uh, helping film that video uh, a bit. And uh, that's when I uh, became friends with Benny. And uh, then um, once Greg uh, moved on to, um, well, yeah, he was on doing vans. And so Benny took on a bigger role at the workshop and was basically in the Greg position. And that was around the cinematographer thing. And uh, just, you know, like you do, just on, on a lot of uh, trips together and you just form that bond over time. And, and Benny's one of those uh, the most unassuming and usually that's the way it goes, you know, um, people uh, and, but a man of, so many talents and abilities, you know, like whether it be filming or how he puts things together. I mean, he he worked with Dill early uh, on hockey, but Dill handed those reins over. Everything you see of hockey, graphic wise, we have all the other people who work with Benny, obviously as well that contribute to that. But that's that's Benny, you know. So all the video stuff is Benny. Um, yeah. He's not out in the streets as much anymore because he's doing so much editing and, you know, uh, ad layouts and all that type of stuff. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, Benny's a huge part of this, this thing. Yeah, he's got, for sure. he's got a good eye for shit, man. Special talent. Like yeah. that cinemat cinematographer edit was yeah. incredible to this day. So yeah. really watchable. And a lot of the hand drawn stuff, like with hockey and stuff, that's Benny. He can draw like, I mean, dude, he stood staying with me one time and he, we had this like clay stuff on my table and he had like made this crazy face out of like claymation. <laughs> I was just like, dude, this fucking guy, man. Like he can do anything. Yeah. 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 Um, a board brand cycle of life almost always includes the younger guys coming of age and leaving to start their own brands. Is right. it a little bittersweet to lose some of your guys and see them start their own? Uh, of course, you know, like, uh, but I, you know, I knew from day one when we did this, we were having any type of uh, success and like having something that lasts, you know, mm -hmm. y you cannot escape that. You yeah. Know? Mm -hmm. People are going to leave and, you know, they're going to, you know, move on to doing their own things or what, whatever, what have you. I mean, I, I've been in skating so long, you know, there's just a number of different roads that come up for everybody, you know, um, and, uh, it's just, you know, inevitable, but yeah, it is, of course it's bittersweet, you know, you never want to see things end, you know, or yeah. whatever, but it happens, you know, that's mm -hmm. just the way it goes. And I've been on the both ends of that, you know, <laughs> in my career. So, yeah. Um, I want to go behind the scenes on one more trick, maybe my favorite trick of yours, other than all your switch trays, uh, <laughs> Switch 5.0 over the top in New York, propeller ender. How was that session? How terrifying was that first try? That was, so that was multiple sessions and trips there. Um, I was there and I had been thinking about doing it and I was on this long, I'd already been there for a couple of weeks and I think I got some other stuff on film and it was towards the end of the trip where I was like, kind of got what I wanted to get done out there. And I was like, okay, I, I'm going to give this one a shot, you know, cause I knew it was going to fuck me up. I didn't want to try it at the start. Cause then I'd be sore the rest mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think it was like our, it was the, the first time I did it was our last, I think it was our last day there or last days. Um, and I couldn't even get switch over it for a while. Like, it took a while to get the snap right to get mm -hmm. over it. And I just got obliterated the first day, like just from impact, you know, just yeah. falling down the stairs. And I gave it a go as to, you know, as, until like there was just nothing left, you know? And, um, I remember we were leaving from that trip to, a, a us, like through Detroit and fuck, where did we go into Ohio through the Midwest, Tennessee, all these places we were leaving from the 
uh, driving from New York and we had driven to Chinatown rail that morning with the rental cars and I was going to do it again. So yeah, I tried it twice and I'm just got smoked and just got in the car and went on tour. And, um, <laughs> and we did that tour, which was gnarly, um, for like two weeks or something. Um, and then, um, I flew home to LA um, and I was home for like two weeks and all I could think about was getting back to New York to try and give that trick a go again. And, uh, this is uh, like towards the end, this was towards the end of propeller and I was fucking crazy. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, there was no balance in my life. Like I had dedicated, I, when I told you earlier, when I said like, I'm going to do this every single, like I was in this zone and I was watching apocalypse now a lot then too. <laughs> And like, there's that, the opening scene where, uh, he, you know, he's on the bed and he's just like Saigon shit. So, and I was like, dude, I, I know this guy, he just needs to get back in the jungle. Yeah. And I felt that way. I was depressed. I was just like, just fuck him at home doing nothing. Yeah. Like I need to get out of here. Like get me back on tour, like, or whatever, you know? So I flew back to New York and I was there by myself and, uh, I would just go there with Bill. I think, yeah, with Bill and jared i went a couple times and i was just staying there in between being sore and trying it wow so i tried it a couple more times and then at the time i whenever i met some girl and briefly and i, I was like you know what i'm gonna go to london and then i'll be back i <laughs> flew to london hung out and then flew right back to new york <laughs> and then that first day back i did it damn and uh i was yeah i was stoked did you know you wanted that to be your ender like the whole time? I think towards the end, like I kind of, I, that was very much like the end of filming or getting there. And I, I knew that that would probably be the one and probably more so because of the history I had with that rail. Yeah. You hit the front five on it before. Yeah. Well, the of. first time I hit it, I, I think I'm the, like, and let's correct me if I'm wrong. I don't want to claim anything, but I think I'm the first one to go over the back of it. I 50 did it um, mm -hmm. in uh, photosynthesis. Okay. So I was way back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I 50 did it there, then returned to it in minefield with a couple of tricks. And then here we are, propeller. So I was like, okay, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, I, I was like, this is probably my ender. So, you know. Another full circle moment, man. It's yeah, perfect ender yeah, for, that for video. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. I read in an interview years ago that you would have to tape your feet to be able to skate. Yeah, is that why over the years your shoes have become more and more progressive as far as technology and materials? Yeah, I mean, I think the simple idea of like saving my feet is for sure. Not necessarily that that particular injury being. Uh, a catalyst for it but um yeah i had a bone spur in the big toe of my uh, in the joint in my big toe mm -hmm. and uh during propeller i thought i was gonna have to get surgery on it i i just kept shooting it with cortisone and it's, which is not really good for you yeah. and uh i think i'd shot it like six times in a year and uh i was getting down to the point where i was like uh I'm gonna have to get surgery on this thing. It's kind of a rough place to get surgery for them to shave that bone down there. Um, and I went to my guy had done a couple of surgeries on my ankle and, uh, he confirmed a yes. Like, so I was getting it, getting the injections in LA and my guy was down in San Diego. So my last time I went down there, scheduled surgery and I was like, all right, give me one more shot be back in three months and he shot it and dude i don't know where he stuck that thing but it like made the pop sound it hurt fuck it was gnarly and then um then i was good to go for like three months and then it just never had the ice pick stabbing pain again and i i don't know what happened it was a fucking miracle <laughs> after i'm talking like five years of taping my foot for 15 minutes doing this crazy turf toe tape job mm -hmm. i had this special tape that is made in germany that uh -oh. is like stretchy but like super rigid and like will never break or fall off from sweat or anything it was fuck it was insane it was an ordeal and then it just went away but uh but yeah 
you know, uh, starting to move from kind of just the standard uh, Volk soul vans is definitely like, yeah, an idea of more comfort and less beating. Yeah, for sure. Hey, uh, if there's any advantage to switch trays, I'm going to have to try a pair, man. We're out here celebrating your new shoe, Ave 2.0. Uh, yeah. Am I going to have two more inches on my switch trays? Do the rubber compound on this one is, <laughs> it, I'm telling you, I ain't bullshitting you. It's it's an upgrade from the last one. So if you rode the last one and did a switch tray, you're going to have an easier time on this oh, one. Oh, let's go, baby. For sure. Sign Ultimate waffle. Sign me up. So if it, and I'll, some, some shoe nerd shit for anybody listening. So, and I learned this through Neil, and I didn't know this going into the shoe. I just heard him talking, Neil, the shoe designer. He, um, so when they redid the Pro Classics a few years back, I don't know how many years ago, if it was like five years ago or something like that, um, and I skated the Pro Classics redo, I was like, dude, th this is fucking insane. How, like, I didn't know you could upgrade this shoe and still have it just be a classic the way that they did. And and uh, and this is the time around the time that my... Uh, Ave Pro came out, um, that that Pro Classic had come out. Um, and uh, come to find out later when we did this, because uh, I was just like, dude, what? This sole is like such an upgrade from the last one. And um, he was saying that the, this is because of the formulation of the rubber compound that they had discovered and started using in the Pro Classics, the latest rendition of them. It's the same stuff that's in here. And it is like, it's great. Yeah. Hell yeah, so. sick. <clears throat> That's the background on that. So what's next for Ave? I'm just getting, you know, I don't know. That question, I always like, I never really know the answer to that question. I just kind of keep going and uh, things have worked out. So I, I, I think that's kind of it. I'm getting uh, through the release of, of this sh new shoe and kind of some traveling coming up and stuff like that. So, you know, I never really know. I just kind of keep doing what I'm doing. So Hell yeah. more switch trays for the people. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'll be doing them. <laughs> I got, <laughs> I don't have a plan through. B, so <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sorry. You gotta keep seeing it. <laughs> hey, we love it. Thank uh, you. All right. We got one last little section, uh, rapid fire, quick question, quick answer. Oh God. I'm gonna shoot him off. A favorite skater. Favorite skater. Guy Mariano is my all-time favorite skateboarder. So, yeah. Favorite video? Favorite video. Um, Tim and Henry, Pack of Lies. Favorite video part? Gino's Yeah Right video part. Um, favorite style? Um, that's probably a mix between, uh, you know, Guy and, and Gino. Which skater had the biggest influence on the way you skate? Um, I'd say like Guy Dill, huge influence on me. Yeah. Most talented skateboarder on planet Earth. Most talented skateboarder on the planet Earth. Fuck, I don't even know. I don't know about that one. I mean, there's a lot, man. I that's a big question. There's a lot. Favorite trick. Um. Ain't nothing like a nice backside tail slide, really. It's, it's a oh, nice yeah. one. Can't go wrong. Yeah. Hardest trick for you? Hardest trick for me. Uh, regular stance kickflip. Uh, right there with you. The struggle's <laughs> real. Uh, most illegal trick? Those tray flips where you leave your leg floating out the back. <laughs> Those and Benny Hanna's. They're like the <laughs> fucking same thing, pretty much. Yeah. Um, favorite clip you've ever gotten? Uh, favorite clip. Um, I, dude, there, it's such a struggle for me to get any fucking clip. They're all my favorite. When I, <laughs> when I ride away, like, God, like, you know, like I told you the story about the over the five of someone would be like, Oh man, how many hours did that take you in that session? Like, how'd you feel after? It's like, no, it took me fucking month. <laughs> <laughs> it took yeah. me a month, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That was my favorite trick for fucking like three months after until I had to go do that again on some other shit. Uh, gnarliest trick you've ever witnessed? Gnarliest trick. Well, the gnarliest, 
Harley. I I did see Reynolds go down the 16 back in the day, like when he was like kind of the first guys to do it. I think he was like doing, I think he kick flipped it or varial healed it. I don't know. It was one of those. That was fucking gnarly. And then I, I was right around the corner when Mumford went down on his head down a 20 stair. Oh, uh, oh. I just, I heard it just like, like if you threw a 200 pound body down some concrete <laughs> stairs, that's what the sound like was some metal banging. <laughs> like, oh, and I damn. came around the corner and he was down there. He tried to caveman 50 this rail. It was in the Transworld video and he, it looked like someone split his head with a hammer. It was so gnarly. Jesus. Damn. So that was definitely like one of the gnarlier things, but obviously he didn't land that, but was, yeah. That's gnarly. What's the one trick that got away? <sighs> one trick that got away? Um, I mean, dude, probably so many. Um, there, there is a trick. I don't know if I can recall a trick that got away. Um, but there is a trick in propeller or a front five of this tall white fence. And I had tried that periodically over the course of two years. Damn. And I thought it was impossible for me to do it. Cause it's just, it was a weird, the bump was really close to the thing. And, uh, but I had finally gotten to a point, I think I had lost like six pounds. I was like in the bed, I was in fucking <laughs> fighting shape. And I would finally like locked in on that video and we went there and I just fucking did it one day. And this is like two years of going there and having chunks of time of like really focused on it and just could never fucking do it. And then finally one day I just went there and, and did it. And that was, so, I mean, that almost got away, but I can't think of one that fully, I mean, there's a bunch. But. The tricks were too shook to get away from you, man. You just had to get them <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah, that was one of those eventually. ones. Like, yeah. I just, fuck, man, I held on to that thing for dear life. What's the last new trick you learned? <sighs> um, I don't know, dude. I don't really learn new tricks. Sometimes relearning tricks, the older you get, feels like The last them again. new trick I did was probably in was in uh wait yeah no uh was in the last video part we did for fa uh the tail slide to switch back tail oh sick on that curve hook yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I did i'd never done that trick i didn't plan on going to do that trick that day and went there and did that trick and i feel like that was the last time i did something like that that i'd never done so sick. yeah dream job after skating Ah, uh, dream retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Favorite local brand. Favorite local brand. Um, fuck. See, I'm so this is I'm so bad at this shit. I don't keep up with stuff. I don't know. You got a homie with a, a little brand or anything you could shout out? Why am I not? I probably do, and I'm probably gonna get in trouble for this. <laughs> I don't fucking know. I'm sorry. I don't even have a. I don't even have an answer for that. Deerdick Slipper Company. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Deerdick Luso Clouds. Go get some comfy. Hell yeah. Uh, favorite local skater. Favorite local skater. Uh, yeah, Big John's my spirit animal. That's Sick. for sure. Hell yeah. Yeah. He's the man. Uh, favorite teammate ever. Favorite teammate. Man, I got a lot of those. It's hard to say like any particular, um, like a favorite. Uh, I, I, I've been incredibly lucky to, you know, uh, be with all my best friends over the years. So it's hard to say anyone favorite, but I will say, you know, the most mileage put down with anybody who has always been a good time is Dill. Sick. for okay. sure 100 percent. i mean we've had we have traveled the entire world together multiple times over and fucking yeah i've been on the road with that guy for months at a time so he's a he's a blast hell yeah yeah worst teammate ever worst teammate ever um dustin dolan was a little like <laughs> oil and water with me <laughs> For sure. Sick. Especially like, I think we really started crossing, uh, traveling together uh, when I was really locking into my sobriety and, you know, he, mm -hmm. he's Dustin, so <laughs> it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, worst company. Worst company. 
Um, currently or just ever? Could be back in the day, anything. Um, fuck. Element. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh shit! Uh, I remember Dilly always always be like, "Fucking save the planet!" Like you guys just fucking cutting down trees and making shit that people fucking <laughs> throw away wood boards that they throw away in two weeks with toxic glue and shit all over them. Earth, wind, and fire. Like <laughs> I was always like, "Yeah, that's pretty fucking lame." <laughs> oh, uh, worst trend. Worst trend. Um, I mean, fuck, I come from Goofy Boy era, so probably that shit. True. Even though I, I have a, a, a place in my heart for it, but that was insane. We all run around in fucking clown pants and shit, <laughs> and like little ass wheels. Yeah. Uh, worst style. Could be back in the day, too. Style didn't matter, or didn't seem to matter quite as much back in those Who has days. the worst style? Mm -hmm. Yeah, skater. Oh my God, dude! We're almost, we're almost at the finish line. We, we like to go. Up, <laughs> Shit, we like dude. to go out with a bang. We're style, man. Fuck, dude! I don't want to answer this question. <laughs> I don't want to answer this question, man. Okay. Um, I'm too old for this question, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I was young, this is a question you answer. Fuck that guy. Yeah. But now it's just like God. Everybody's just trying to get by, man. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Come on, I ain't doing that one. Fuck That's that. Fair. All good. All good. Uh, last but not least, last person you want on the sesh? It's the fucking same question. <laughs> Ish. Yeah. Well, fuck, I already threw Dustin under the bus. Sorry, dude. Oh, oh shit. shit. <laughs> oh, man. Because that motherfucker, he'd be drunk on the session. And I'd be trying to fucking some trick like I do for 37 hours. And he used to just fucking... I mean... With all due respect, that motherfucker will launch himself off some shit that you better land on the board because you only get two tries at that. Yeah. Where me, I'd be over here whittling on some shit, <laughs> you know, and he'd be like, fucking dead. Ah! And you're just trying to like focus and you got this drunk fucking gremlin yelling at you. It's just like, fuck. Oh, shit. No disrespect, bud. Yeah. All right, Anthony, that's a wrap on all the right. interview. Thank you again for coming through and congrats on Ave 2.0, man. For sure. Thank you very much. Hell yeah. Right on. Thank you. Right on.